Tom lives in San Jose and is a doctor of Chinese medicine. He does meditations that you can find on CDs that are back there and um, has been fascinated by the Seth material for many years and integrating the Seth material with traditional Chinese medicine. So it's a fascinating conjunction. Um, it'd be fascinating, wouldn't it, to have Dr. Shu here and uh, <laughs> trade, uh, trade insights with Dr. Su uh, someday. Hmm? Next year, yeah, possibly. Maybe you could do a kind of one-two thing. Uh, all right, so um, now that we're all kind of gathered, I'll just say that um, uh, I'm very pleased to uh, introduce you to Tom Leichhardt. I started practicing medical Qigong, which is a form of Chinese energetic medicine, about 15 years ago. And coincidentally, about the same time, I got turned on to the set material. And so it was really amazing that through the practices, through the various Taoist meditations and practices and movement practices of Qigong, I started to really feel energy and to work with energy. And meanwhile, I was reading about energy and about manifestation in the Seth material, so it was this perfect conglomeration. Oftentimes I would find the Seth description would actually be a lot better and more clear than even some of the Chinese texts. So I really kept this, uh, I really kept reading the Seth material and really kept integrating the two together like this. And so uh, that brings me to this current point. And so now uh, I'm integrating the Seth material into the practice of Chinese medicine as well as into spiritual practices. Uh, and uh, you're really using the Taoist meditations to help people open up their inner senses because that's really what the, the meditations are geared to do. I also train people in using energy, that is uh, training people to use it for uh, purposes of healing and helping others. And so I just love that marriage. It's really, really incredible to actually have an energetic cultivation practice and then to have the Seth material. It's really the two, when they come together, it's like they form a whole, a whole new perspective. So my talk today, as you can see, is on dreams and out-of-body experiences. And so before I uh, get into uh, talking about it, defining it, and, and what Seth says about it, I'd like to actually ask the audience, how many of you have out-of-body experiences? About half, it looks like. So um, what I'm here to tell you, and what Seth is here to tell you, is that actually everybody has out-of-body experiences. So astral projection, Seth says, occurs frequently in the sleeping state. It also occurs, however, in the waking state, although the ego is not aware of such projections as a rule. The astral self journeys often whether the ego wakes or sleeps. So what we really want to realize is that we are multidimensional beings and we have these abilities and we actually are doing this all the time. And so here's uh, another quote from Seth. Let me remind my readers that each of them leaves the body for some time during each night during sleep. So Seth, in, in many places, says that these experiences are happening all the time. So it's not a matter of developing some crazy mystical art that only a select few humans get to have. This is something that we're doing all the time. So it's like, how do we, how do we bring conscious awareness into this? So... Another quote, now I am taking considerable time to deal with projections because on a spontaneous basis they occur more or less constantly. Spontaneous projections do occur constantly in every consciousness. So it's not even just relegated to the realm of human beings, it's every consciousness has projections and, and we can easily come to this conclusion because all realities kind of exist in the multi-reality. There's, there's, there's various levels of existence, and so every consciousness has these different levels, and obviously consciousness uh, moves in between these levels all the time. And another quote, uh, whether or not projections are conscious, they occur in any case, and the personality learns from them. The conscious projection, however, involves a much higher achievement. So what Seth is telling us is, what, what we want to do is just bring conscious awareness into what we already are and into 
into the abilities that we already have. So it's kind of a different way of looking at it. So obviously becoming conscious is the name of the game here. So uh, in this pre presentation, I'm going to um, present several ways in which we can bring that conscious awareness into these natural abilities that we have. In terms of benefits of out-of-body experiences, uh, Seth has a couple good quotes here. Through projections, you will become acquainted with the mobility and stability of the inner self as separate from the physical apparatus. Literally, death will no longer appear frightening. And uh, one more. After leaving the physical body, you will immediately find yourself in another. This is the same kind of form in which you travel in out-of-body projections. So he's, he's very clearly saying that when we drop the physical body, we, we take existence in this form, which is our astral body or the energy body, however you want to call it. And so we have the ability to become conscious of that now. So in other words, we can learn to have uh, faith and trust that we do have continuity of consciousness and that we can leave the time-space continuum. And there's no, well, I'm not going to say no better way, but a powerful way to, to, to leave the time-space continuum is to have an out-of-body experience and to fully immerse your, your waking consciousness into the inner reality. So essentially, uh, we become increasingly aware of the workings of the inner ego and the inner self through these experiences. Our waking consciousness then, through these experiences, begins to, to, to develop a much broader perspective. We, we, we lose our, our attachment to perceiving things through uh, sequential moments in time and space, and we begin to broader into more of who we are, into other layers of, of consciousness, which are organized in a completely different way than, than through time and through space. So in a lot of places, Seth mentions how literally a new consciousness is born when the external ego, when the waking consciousness becomes more and more and increasingly acquainted with the inner ego or the inner self. So, of course, uh, benefits of out-of-body exploration are, uh, there's several, and uh, this realization of eternal life, of eternity, uh, of this great spaciousness on an emotional and intuitive level, and that's the important part, because a lot of times we read these things and we say, like, oh, yeah, of course, we, ex we exist beyond the body. We think uh, intellectually, and so we think that we get this truth intellectually, and that's fine, but it's just a whole other level when emotionally and intuitively you can feel that as that's, that's the way things are. And of course, through these experiences, you get to find out for yourself. You don't have to rely on your religions. You don't have to rely on your sciences. You know, it's, it kind of harkens back to that quote uh, Linda gave us at the start of her talk. You get to find out for yourself. You get to viscerally and tangibly experience uh, these other realities of who you are. So you don't even have to take Seth's word for it. You can, just, you can have your own experience to validate all of this material. So of course, it's a means of gaining knowledge about who we are, about ourselves, and about the different levels of consciousness that we exist in at simultaneously. And of course, it helps us to tap into those various levels of the self. And uh, something that I'm really excited about is also it teaches us a great deal about conscious reality creation because in the physical realm, you have that buffer of time, which, which means that you don't get inundated with manifestation right away. You have, you have time. In a more thought-responsive environment, you have to take much more responsibility for your state of consciousness because things, anything that flows through your mind has the potential of being externalized and instantaneously, so you've got to have a handle on your vibration through that. And learning to consciously focus vitality and seeing immediate, re immediate results just, just changes your whole uh, belief structure. So obviously through that you accelerate your uh, spiritual and psychological development just, just by learning to bring your waking consciousness and merging it with the inner ego or the inner self is tremendous, lot, tremendous expansion takes place through that. And last but not least, of course, they are incredibly uh, liberating and fun and incredibly rewarding experiences. So... Uh, a few more quotes on benefits uh, from Seth. After physical death, after the last incarnation, then the normal body form is the dream body, and excursions are made from this point, you see. 
So what Seth is saying is actually that once we drop the physical body, our base of operations is going to be based from the non-physical body. And from there, we're going to project and learn about other realities and expand our consciousness from there. So why not take the time now to get acquainted with who we are in the process of, of becoming? All projections, Seth says, involve literally an extension of identity and self. The usual limitations set upon the self by the ego vanish. Now, this gives some hint to the abilities that exist for the individual in future existences. So, obviously, he's saying that, you know, looking at this in terms of evolution, which I know is a, is a linear time format, it's still, uh, he's highlighting that these natural abilities are just, it's what we're destined to develop anyway. And then we can take an active part now and really bring ourselves into these states of consciousness uh, through our intention. So, uh, moving onwards. Projections involve many more aspects of the whole self and are a mark that the personality is progressing in important ways. The inner senses are allowed their greatest freedom in projection states, and the whole self retains experience that it would not otherwise. When this knowledge becomes part of the usual waking consciousness, that is, when you realize what you have done, then you have taken a gigantic step forward. So what Seth is talking about is this merging of this, this uh, external focused reality, uh, presence that we are as this external ego, merging that with the inner ego. And, and, he, and I always just love to reiterate this because it's so profound. Literally, a whole new state of consciousness will be born from that union of the external ego and the inner self. And then he goes on to say that almost, an almost automatic determination must be set up, however, if projections with conscious awareness are to be anything but rare oddities. So he's basically telling us that, like, yeah, this is who you are in a state of becoming, looking at it from a, a linear time format, or you can say it's, it's who you already are. But we gotta, he's saying we've got to put in a little bit of focus here, here to make this, make this happen. So before we go gallivanting around the universe and exploring all kinds of dimensions of existence, it's good to get some essential metaphysics under your belt. And of course, what Seth has been hammering at us for, for years and through many, many sessions, you get what you concentrate upon. There is no other main rule. So in thought-responsive environments, this becomes incredibly critical, and we'll talk more about that. Of course, you create your own reality. So uh, another way of saying that is you bring about what you think about. So all of this it becomes super poignant in out-of-body states because you're instantly manifesting what you're thinking all the time. You don't have the buffer of time. Now, and uh, this is for Lawrence's benefit, it has also been translated as the law of attraction in recent years. And so um, it's another way of looking at it is that your own vibration actually uh, determines your, your experience. It's just putting the same thing that Seth says in other terms so that more people can understand it. So in an out-of-body state, your inner vibration tends to translate into so-called external reality within that plane of existence rather instantaneously. So you're attracted in directions that match your inner state, and you manifest whatever uh, vibration is, is moving through your inner self instantaneously. So the main point is you want to learn to effectively regulate the direction and flow of your thought and intention before moving into more thought-responsive dimensions of existence with your conscious mind. So like I've uh, mentioned already, the physical realm has this really, really nice buffer of time. And so we, we, have, we have the ability to breathe, we have the ability to meditate, we can change our point of focus. And in a lot of ways, I think that makes us, uh, it, it, it's a buffer and it also makes us sloppy in some sense because we don't have immediate feedback, usually. We, we can go in a certain negative direction of thought, and, and the manifestation kind of lags, and we start, we start to see, we start to lose the connection between our inner state and then external reality. So through these out-of-body experiences, we, we regain that knowledge, that innate knowledge. When you have the visceral, real, tangible experience of instant manifestation, you start to see that all reality operates in this way. So you start to kind of see through the mirage or through the the camouflage of the physical realm. Of course, uh, continuing on with essential metaphysics, it's really, uh, for me, I feel it's really important to have some form of a cultivation practice 
in which you can work with the mind and, and prepare yourself to enter into these more subtle planes. And so, obviously, Qigong, yoga, Tai Chi, meditation, all of these kinds of practices, they help in two really, really important ways. First of all, is you just want to get aware and conscious of what's going on through your mind. And uh, in the physical realm, like I said, you don't have that immediate feedback, but in, in thought-responsive realms, that becomes a primary, primary concern, is what's floating through your mind, what's your, point of, what's your focus, what's your point of attraction. And of course, these practices also train us in a really safe and, and systematic way. They train the focus of the mind, and, and this focus becomes incredibly important as you start to move into the subtle planes. So learning to direct and focus thought and energy, this is, this is absolutely key. And you can use these practices to develop those abilities, and they, they, they greatly help not only in the physical plane, but in all your otherworldly experiences. So basically, uh, summarizing, getting a handle on our vibration and point of attraction are just absolutely necessary in order to have any kind of a, a fun and rewarding experience in the, other, in the inner realities. And that's even true for the physical realm as well. So if we can't change our vibration, and this part is important, we must deal with whatever reality we have created in the terms that we have created it in. So if we go into a negative state that becomes immediately projected into external experience, if we don't have the capacity to awaken within that and own our power and to, to own our power in the present, then we have to deal with that reality into whatever terms that we cast it into. And so you know, unsavory characters, demons, and so forth, all of these, these uh, projections that come to us, if we can't awaken and change our point of focus, then, you know, you got to deal with it at that level. So, uh, continuing on with uh, cultivation practices, uh, here's a quote from Seth. The yoga exercises allow you, when they are faithfully executed, to draw an abundance, indeed a superabundance of energy. This energy results also in chemical excesses that can be utilized in projections. And even though I haven't really practiced yoga, I practice Qigong, which is sometimes called Taoist yoga. This, I, I know this for sure to be absolutely true. There's been times when, when my practices are really deep and I'm generating a lot of energy, I know that I'm just so much more likely to have an out-of-body experience from that. So this, this, this quote is, is perfectly uh, valid to my experience. So uh, the posture that I'm holding here in the picture is um, it's from a Taoist practice called the uh, each one practice. It's a way of holding a standing meditation to induce vibration, resonant vibration in the body. And what actually happens is you're actually turning on the awareness of your energy body. So even though you're maintaining your, your physical focus, you're actually building those bridges through this practice. And that gives you that ability to, of the waking consciousness to, to travel into these dimensions with your energy body. So Seth gives eight root assumptions somewhere in the uh, early sessions. I believe it's volume six. So we'll just go through those because these are uh, root assumptions. They help kind of extricate you from this uh, locked-in physical focus and, and give you a broader, a much broader picture of reality. So one, and this is direct quotes from Seth. One, energy and action are basically the same, although neither must necessarily apply to physical motion. And so these root assumptions are ones you just, just hear it, let it sink in, and just let your inner being tell you uh, what it means. Two, all objects have their origin basically in mental action. Mental action is directed psychic energy. Three, permanence is not a matter of time, Existence has value in terms of intensities. Four, objects are blocks of energy perceived in a highly specialized manner. Five, stability in time sequence is not a prerequisite requirement for an object, except as a root assumption within the physical universe. Six, space as a barrier does not exist. Seven, the spacious present is here more available to the perceptions. He's referring to out-of-body and dream states. And finally, last but not least, the only barriers within inner reality are mental barriers or psychic barriers. So he's giving us kind of a, a roadmap, so to speak, and, and we can sit with these root assumptions and really meditate on them. And I could probably take one of them and spend the entire time just talking about one. So uh, 
you know, we don't have time to do that here, but that's, that's the work um, that is for us to do to help us expand our consciousness. Uh, so early session seven. Okay, so I'm sure you're wondering by now, so how do I get out, right? So conscious manifestation, uh, I'm discovering, has, has two main elements, and, and there's other ways to frame it, so just for now, I'm just kind of go with this one. For one, the first element is the strong desire. You've got to have a really strong desire to do something. And then that strong desire translates then into focus and action. And the second half of the equation is there's got to be like this, this part of allowing, enabling it to happen. And, and that's, where, that's, that's where the beliefs can be really powerful and changing. So the believing that it is possible is, is the part that allows it to happen. So the first part, the strong desire and commitment. So just like any skill that you intend to learn, dream art science is going to take some desire, focus, and commitment. And this doesn't mean it has to be hard or difficult or, or challenging or you have to persevere, none of that garbage. But it does take focus. And, and focus is born out of that desire. It's like, how bad do you want this experience? So you have to ask yourself those questions. How committed am I? And how much do I really, really want this? And the next question is, how much time do I have? And am I willing to devote to these kinds of practices? Because like any skill, it's going to take some time. It's going to take some focus. And you've got to you know, you kind of roll your sleeves up and, and just kind of do, do, do the work or the play or however you want to frame that. So uh, essentially, you, you want to make this a priority in one way or another. So you, have, you just want to make this important. So like I said, the strength of desire largely determines the intensity of your focus. And here's Seth, and we already looked at this quote. An almost automatic determination must be set up, however, if projections with conscious awareness are to be anything but rare oddities. And so then there's the second component, and that's the belief, uh, the belief systems that may help you or hinder you. So uh, you can call this core belief change, you can Call, call this belief reappraisal, or cultivating a, men, a proper mental climate. However you want to phrase it, it's a two, mostly a two-step process. One is just becoming aware of what are my beliefs, and then the ones that are not conducive, you, you do some work to change. So you want to explore those core beliefs about out-of-body, because we all have various beliefs we've picked up along our physical trail, and so you want to ask yourself, do I, is this difficult or easy? Do I have the ability? Do I have what it takes to have this experience? Am I afraid of getting out? And if I am afraid, why? Do, do I live in a safe universe, or am I afraid of forces beyond my control coming, inserting themselves into my experience? So you, you got to look at all that. Or are, is there any concerns about not being able to come back? Sometimes people have a fear of, of you know, what if I get out there so far I can't make my, my way back? So what are my expectations of this experience? So when you ask yourself this question, these questions, you can either mentally just, just get your own sense of your inner vibration, or you can actually take the time, write it out in a journal, which oftentimes that is actually a good process. It helps kind of externalize inner vibration into to something that we can see and then kind of uh, look at. And of course, once you get aware of those uh, belief systems, then you can initiate some, some form of change. And of course, uh, nature of personal reality goes into exquisite detail how this can be done, and, and this could be another whole series of presentations. So we're just barely highlighting this, this, this aspect. Uh, for those that are interested, William Buhlman's uh, Adventures Beyond the Body also has a, a very condensed form of, of, of looking at and changing core beliefs relating specifically to out-of-body experiences. So that's a nice, uh, nice book as well. Okay, continuing with how to... How do I get out? Here's Seth. Your attitudes towards what is possible determines what is possible for you in very definite terms. Your attitudes create possibilities and impossibilities. Uh, that's something we could just sit with and meditate on it and, and repeat even daily and just, just recognize the power of that statement. And then he continues. These laws apply to all. What you expect, you create. And that is the beginning and end of it, whether you are speaking in, of psychic matters or physical matters. Until you learn this, you learn little. And until you learn this, you do not know what it means to be practical. If you did not think projection was possible for you, you would never achieve a projection. 
You create your reality, and no one else can create it for you. So he's, he keeps delivering us the keys to the universe, saying it's, it's all inside you. It's, it's your ability to just, just allow your natural innate um, knowledge of who you are to just come forth and just bubble forth into your experience. So basically, without a body experiences, you just got to believe that it's going to be easy. You have to believe that you, you do have the ability. You have to believe in a relatively safe universe for, for these experiences to happen, or your ego is just going to block out of fear. You have to own your power, and you have to believe in your effectiveness within the physical plane and within all planes of reality. So otherwise, the ego finds all kinds of reasons to fear and distrust the experience, and from that, it just blocks your conscious awareness from moving into these other realms of existence. So that brings us, of course, to techniques. So William Buhlman wrote this awesome book, Adventures Beyond the Body. He describes the target technique, and of course, Seth beat him to it. He was first. So here's uh, Seth's quote. It might be of benefit if you concentrate before sleep upon a simple projection that involves leaving the body, walking out into this room, for example, or perhaps strolling around the block. And by this room, he's obviously referring to the room in which the sessions are having, into your living room, into any room in your house you can use as your, your, your target location. Now, in falling off to sleep, for example, imagine that you are in your yard, in another room of your apartment, or in front of the house. So that's basically the target technique in a nutshell. And and if you want more detail, William Buhlman's, uh, William Buhlman's book is, is absolutely excellent and give, can give you all those details about the target technique. Uh, and we'll cover just a little bit of this here today. First, I would recommend, it's, this is not necessary, but it, it's a good suggestion to create a designated exploration area. This is an area that's not in your bed where you're conditioned to just kind of go unconscious create a separate designation, designated exploration area. Like it can be a, a favorite sofa, a nice easy chair that you can recline in, and do your target technique from there. Next is you want to choose a target to which you have affinity to. And so being Seth readers, we, understood, we understand that reality is not just segmented by time and space. It's your, your affinity to an object or to a person, to a place. And so if you pick an object or person or place with, a, with an affinity, it's going to draw your consciousness into that, into that state much more easily. And so incidentally, uh, usually target locations are, are physical places, but they can also be, for example, your pets. If you have a really strong bond with, with, with an animal, with a pet, you can actually use them as one of the target locations and meet them in a non-physical uh, state. It's a, it's a really kind of a nice way to practice this. Of course, just like... Uh, any meditation technique, you're going to relax the body. You're, you're relaxing your attachment to physical stimuli. And I like to use a semi-reclining position because I find that if I go fully uh, horizontal, I, there's a tendency to slip into unconsciousness a little too soon. So I like to be just relaxed, kind of half reclining, and that is what works best for me. Of course, you have to experiment with this and find out what works for you. And then once you get your body relaxed, then you practice full immersion in, your, in, your, in the environment that you're visualizing. You, you want to put yourself there fully and completely. You want to see, you want to feel, you want to smell, you want to completely immerse yourself in the target location. Next, uh, this can be also useful is if you're focusing on, on, a, on a place, is you can actually pick up objects in your imagination so that you can increase uh, the sensory experience of this, of this other location. So you want to feel the weight, the texture, the temperature of objects as you pick them up imagine, in your imagination, in your hands. And last but not least is uh, you can also do a physical walkthrough through the location, through the room that you're going to choose as your location. Do a physical walkthrough, really go, physically go there, take in all the detail, touch the walls, notice the colors, the inconsistencies, all those little details, pick up those objects, you know, one, two, three objects, and just really just get the full sensory experience. And I find that often this will really enhance your ability to go there in your mind. And this, this technique, I'm highlighting it so much because it, it's really, really powerful. But we you got to really stick with this one. It's really easy to start a practice and then just say, oh, nothing's happening, you know, after two weeks or, or whatever. 
actually a lot is happening through the levels. When we do these practices, things start to line up in framework too, but you, you gotta have a little patience for it to make its way down into, into a time-space sequential reality. Your ego's gotta be ready for the experience. So oftentimes uh, with cultivation practices, before major breakthroughs, people can kind of pull back and say, oh, I don't feel anything's happening. And they're just about to come up on a major breakthrough. And so you wanna have the follow through. You wanna make this just a habitual practice and you'll have many experiences along the way um, where you have like, you feel sudden accelerations of consciousness and, and you start to feel yourself teetering away from the physical body and into this non-physical environment. You're gonna have these little experiences that are gonna tell you that you're, you're progressing in the right direction. But what you wanna do is have conscious expectation but don't constantly be looking like, okay, like. Is today the day? Is today the day? Because that kind of blocks the experience. And there's going to be natural ebbs and flows in your practices. Because we live in a temporal dimension, everything has cyclical nature. You know, there's cycles of the moon, cycles of the day and night and tides and so forth. It's all about cycles. So your practices are going to have the same kind of wave pattern. You're going to have periods of peak activity where a lot's happening, and then you're going to have periods of where you're going through the valley and not a lot seems to be happening even though in simultaneous time, everything's, everything's all right there, but we're here to experience the cyclical nature of things. So it's easy to be discouraged in the down, you know, when you're in the valley. So what you want to do is just, you know, just stay true to your practices and just, just ride those waves. Here's Seth on suggestions. So you can also use suggestions to, to enhance your experience, and you can use them before falling asleep just to induce a, a conscious projection from the dream state. You can also use your suggestions before you do your target technique. Uh, anytime. Suggestions are, are really powerful, as, as we're going to see here. So here's Seth. Suggestion given before sleep will greatly add to your chances of conscious projections from the dream state. The suggestion, I will realize while dreaming that I am dreaming, can also be used as another method. And so for me, it's a continuum of consciousness. You have uh, unconscious dreaming, conscious dreaming, and then you have the out-of-body experience. And it's a continuum. It's not like you cross some threshold and like magically you're out of body. There's many gradations. And so what, you, what I find, at least for myself, is once I get into the lucid dream state, from there out of body is really easy because your conscious awareness is already there. And so you just have to make yourself aware that you're in a vehicle of consciousness that's not physical. And then you realize, oh, okay, I'm out of body, great. So, so the suggestions that Seth is saying to use helps to bring your conscious awareness into the dreaming state. And then from there, you just, you just take it from there. And so here's a more powerful quote on suggestion, which will definitely dovetail into what Linda was saying earlier. Incidentally, suggestion will reach many aspects of the self, and some of which are very distant to the ego, for you are setting into motion psychic action, which is behind all realities. Suggestion will reach portions of the self of which the ego is entirely unfamiliar. Suggestion can indeed change experience with which has already passed. And then continuing along the same line, the inner senses will also react to suggestion. If you therefore suggest that you become more aware of their activities, then so you shall. You are giving suggestions whether or not you realize it constantly. You are forming your own physical image with all its strengths and weaknesses, whether or not you are aware of it. So essentially, Seth is saying that when we give suggestions, we sometimes just don't realize the power of that. It literally just ripples up through all the levels of the self into, into dimensions we can't even begin to conceive. So suggestion is, is, is supremely powerful. And he goes on to say, we're doing this all the time. We're sending out suggestions all the time, and then they come back to us as reality. So here's some suggestion examples. And so the ones in blue are, are, are geared more towards uh, dream conversion, which means... Uh, converting a, a non-conscious uh, dream into a lucid dream, and then an, an out-of-body experience from that. So as you're falling asleep, you can say to yourself gently, as I fall asleep, I will wake in another reality. I easily realize that I am dreaming. I easily come awake within my dreams. I easily notice that I am dreaming. And then uh, these last three you can use definitely also before your target technique as well. I easily separate from my body. Now I am out of body. I love being out of body. So these are, all, these are more like affirmations you can use uh, anytime. 
And here's a little bit on affirming the self or, or forming beliefs that are conducive to out-of-body experiences. And this is a direct quote from Seth. The more a belief encourages you to use your own abilities and vitality, the, then the more affirmative it is. And continuing, you will not use your spacious mind until you affirm its reality within yourself and until you are ready to handle the additional data that will then become consciously available to one extent or another. So some examples of affirmations that, have, that I've worked with and have really worked for me, and my favorite one is this. I am a powerful, conscious, out-of-body explorer. I easily have powerful and rewarding out-of-body experiences. And so remember that quote on suggestions, how it ripples through the different levels of the self. I have the ability to explore beyond my physical limits. I create my reality. I live in a safe universe. I am in control of my own experience. And so here we're going a little bit broader because we want to send the mes message and the suggestion that we, we do live in a safe universe so that there's, there's no concerns uh, hanging about in our vibrational state of getting out and what we're going to encounter out there. And of course, reaffirming that we do create our reality, not only the reality of, of desiring to project, but also that once we're out there, that we, 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 we do control the experience. <coughs> And of course, another one, I live in a multidimensional universe. I am a multidimensional being. It kind of just a broad perspective of just, just helping the ego to just kind of ease into this extra knowledge that is already a part of who you are. What I've also noticed is sometimes it can be very helpful to write things down as a point of focus. So writing down your goals, your spiritual goals, and even you know, physical goals, any goals, can be a really powerful way of helping the mind to focus. We, we're trained to see things in an external way, and when we write things, there, there's a powerful uh, focusing aspect to that. Now, it's, it's really important to talk about the vibrational state when we're talking about out-of-body experiences. And so this is an effect that occurs when you have the energy body superimposed on top of the physical body, and your consciousness, your waking consciousness, has already moved into the energy body, but you haven't yet separated from the physical body. So what this feels like literally is like the two bodies are out of phase with each other. You no longer have conscious control of your physical body. There's, you can't control that one, but you can control your energy body. But because of the way the bodies are superimposed on each other, they seem to create this, these various sensations that can be either incredibly powerful or they can be very gentle and mild, depending. Uh, each time it can be quite a bit different. So. Vibrational states are not experienced when you project directly into an environment and you, and you don't go through the process of moving out of body. And so most of my projections are done that way. I, I actually, through the use of the target technique, just find myself in the new environment. I don't typically go through the vibrational state if it's going to lead to an out of body. Although I've had uh, many experiences of the vibrational state in which it didn't actually go move into a full conscious projection. So. Uh, these states can be incredibly shock shocking and startling, and they might even uh, be very frightening. And those were my early experiences when I started uh, running a lot of energy through my body due to the Qigong. It would stimulate vibrational state experiences, but I had no idea what was happening, unfortunately. So I didn't know that uh, you know, I was moving into the energy body and that I could project outward. And sometimes there were very pleasurable experiences because it was just like so much energy rising, uh, moving through the body. I could even... Uh, pull out my astral hands and look and notice how they're see-through and all that. It's amazing I didn't think to project outward. Apparently, I wasn't ready at that time. So, uh, but other times, I'd actually have really frightening experiences. I'd have the vibrational state experience, and I couldn't move my body because my consciousness has already moved into the energy body. And so it'd be very frightening when, when you, you feel like all of a sudden you're, you're literally paralyzed. You can't move your body. So. What we want to do is, is we want to have an awareness of these states so they don't start a lesson so that we can use them to our advantage. So just to describe the vibrational state, uh, mild to intense vibrations, electric, tingling, and literally mild to, to intense, it, it's a massively large scale. Uh, buzzing, humming, roaring sounds. I had one experience where it literally felt like there was a lion inside my energy body just roaring, just I mean, very, very strong experiences. So unusual body sensations, and they can vary. What's interesting is the vibrational state. You, you think you get a handle on what it feels like, and then you'll get one that's so completely different that sometimes you can miss it. 
uh, unusual sounds inconsistent with your physical environment. So uh, you might hear like wind chimes, even though you don't have any around. You might hear various forms of, of sounds or singing. Some people report hearing their name called. Uh, pops and gunshots are, are common uh, as uh, an experience of actual the, the separation point. The sound of like a roaring engine. I've had this experience where, where I'm I'm in my body and all of a sudden it just feels like either someone drove a Harley Davidson into the room and just, you know, gunning the engine. It's like, oh my God. And, and it, those are things that tip you off. Okay, I'm about to have a non-physical experience because uh, I'm, I'm having these experiences that are, you know, they, they, they don't necessarily belong in the physical world. So various rushes of energy, of course. And uh, here's two that are really important. Sometimes you sense another presence in the house. And so Seth, uh, I'll read the quote for you. He talks about uh, helpers and guides of various types being around. Sometimes you sense these, these other presences. And then, of course, the numbness and the inability to move the body, which uh, in uh, some Western medicine aspects has been termed dream paralysis, in which case that can become really frightening. So it's really good to get a handle on what, what this looks like, what this feels like. You want to become familiar with this state. You want to learn to recognize it. And from that point, allow it and encourage it, and then uh, will yourself away from the body. And that brings us to methods of separation from the vibrational state. So the first one is floating out. And this is, uh, this is pretty common. Uh, William Buhlman did kind of a nice service for us because he, he took a massive survey and surveyed what are common experiences uh, for out-of-body. And so we have a lot of nice kind of data that way. And so floating out is, is, is one way. Once you feel that you are in the energy body, you just uh, will yourself to float out. What's a lot easier is actually sitting up and just getting out. Because this action mimics a physical action you're really familiar with, it's not such a, a drastic shock to the waking consciousness. You don't get these beliefs getting in the way. It's just you do something that's easy for you, and then you can develop your abilities from there. Uh, rolling out, this is kind of fun. I was uh, having a vibrational state experience once where I couldn't lift out of the body. I couldn't get out. I just felt stuck, and I just, like, I really wanted that experience because, uh, you know, it's like you're halfway there, you know. So I just got this intuition to just kind of rock my energy body and then eventually just kind of roll myself out of bed. And so next thing I knew, I was on the ground, and I, I looked at my hands, and I'm like, oh, yeah, I did it. Awesome. So... Definitely the rolling out. Definitely keep that one in your back pocket. Affirmation. Uh, you can just affirm to yourself, I move out now. It's a, affirmation is just a, a way of, of verbally stating your intention. Uh, focus, which is what I tend to do if I notice I'm in a vibrational state. Rather than trying to go through that process of separating, I just do the target technique really intensely, and then I just immediately just kind of find myself in another environment, and, and I skip that whole separate from the body part. And of course, uh, it's not always successful, so don't set yourself up for, uh, you know, if you have a series of vibrational state experiences, see that as a positive thing. See that you're, you're halfway there, you're well on your way there. And, and don't discount it because you don't necessarily have the full out-of-body experience that you want. Oftentimes, and it still happens to me where I'll have a vibrational state and I won't separate for, for various reasons. So there's different stages, and I'm sure there's an innate wisdom to to what you're ready for in that particular time and space and what your ego is ready to handle in that particular moment in time. And so last but not least is requesting assistance. And here's a, a quote from Seth. He says basically that we are accompanied by you know, so-called guides or helpers during these times. And here's the direct quote. There are indeed others who can help you in such experiences and who often do while you are in the dream state, whether or not you know it. They can be of great assistance as guides. And that's early session six. All right, so obviously we've got to talk about vehicles of consciousness. When you're out of the physical body, you don a vehicle of consciousness that's different, that's geared to, to operate in a different uh, realm of reality, a different range of vibration. So here's Seth. And he's describing three forms. He essentially says there's, there, it's limitless to the amount of vehicles you can have because consciousness and the self is unlimited. But... He does describe three distinct uh, uh, types of bodies. In the first form, it is possible to perceive the past, present, and future on a limited basis. In the second form, this perception is on a larger scale, the scope of consciousness being further opened. 
Now, this is the form that you will use if you meet appointments with others within the dream state. The third form we may call the true projection form. In it, it is possible to travel beyond your solar system and to perceive the past, present, and future in other systems as well as your own. And continuing onwards, the form itself is not important, but the form can tell you something about the dimension in which you are having experience. So what, what he's saying essentially is that it's not the form that determines the experience. You, you take the form based on what, what you're ready to allow into your experience. It's, it's based on your inner vibration. Where are you at uh, within your, your entity? What, which level of consciousness are you operating at at, at that time? And it's your waking consciousness that has that ability to move between all these different levels. The form that you, that form that you use does not dictate the various abilities. You don the particular form in line with your abilities. You do the best you can, in other words. It is possible to begin an experience in one form and change to another, or go from the first to the third. On such occasions, you must therefore, you see, pass through in reverse direction, the forms do merely represent various stages of consciousness. And so it's, it's always important to re reiterate, we exist on all these levels all the time simultaneously. These experiences are, it's who we are, it's the core of who we are. We're just learning to take this waking consciousness on a journey through the levels of who we are. I mentioned that double and triple, I mentioned that double and even triple projections can occur as you adopt forms. These forms represent forms that your personality will take in future existences. They are adopted to meet the particular requirements of the environment in which they are used. So he's, he's reiterating that the body form is geared specifically to operate within a certain range of vibration, which is a reflection of literally where you're at in your inner vibration in relationship to, to who you are on all these different levels. These forms do exist as your physical body does. They are fused, however, with your inner self. They are not physical, but they do exist in the whole package of the self, perhaps like the skins of an onion, you see. They are merely forms your consciousness takes in different dreams. Speaking of dreams, uh, I find that projections from the dream states are, are by far the easiest to, to, to develop and to have. But I also find that practicing the target technique regularly, it predisposes my consciousness to operate in this way. And so it makes, I, I know there's a direct correlation between practicing the technique and learning to, to, to take the waking consciousness into that hypnagogic uh, lucid state and learning to operate within there, feeling comfortable in there, and then having full-blown uh, conscious out-of-body experiences at night. So here's Seth, he's saying, when you project from the dream body, you see, consciously you are already outside as a rule. You have already made the initial change away from physical focus. The mass of valid projections are indeed made from the dreaming body. When the excursion is over, the return to the dream body is made with no strain, you see, for the ego is little concerned. In most such instances, however, the knowledge is then not available to the waking self at all. So he's talking about this is what happens all the time, but because there are, are these layers of the self, this information is, that we're building the bridges, we're, we're building that bridge between the inner and the outer ego. And so in the present or, or the, the past state, it used to be that we don't have those linkages, but he goes on to say that as your abilities develop and as you become more accustomed to the experience, the waking consciousness will recall, will recall more and more and not become so frightened. So through through our intention, through our natural evolution, spiritual growth, through the natural acceptance of who we are, we tap into, into those, those other realities. We bring that waking consciousness uh, into other levels of the self. So, of course, when we're talking out of, about out-of-body experiences and finding ourselves in, in various environments that are non-physical, we have to talk a little bit about how do you get around in these places. You're talking about no time and no space, so that's kind of, it's pretty mind-blowing. So, you have to realize that movement occurs at the speed of thought. And space being irrelevant, motion can become instantaneous. Oftentimes in out-of-body states, we like to give ourselves the experience of motion because that's what we're used to. We like translating things in terms of time and space. So oftentimes we'll, we'll feel ourselves move to the location in, in a kind of swiftly moving current or whatnot. But basically that is not necessary. You can literally think the location and instantaneously, boom, you're there. 
that's how you, you, tell, you transport yourself at the speed of thought. So you want to be obviously mindful of the direction of your thought because the thought is the current that will take you to wherever you're going next. Thoughts of the physical body may bring you back, ending the experience. So this isn't just stray random thoughts of the physical body, but if you do focus your attention on the physical body, you will have a tendency to just follow that thought right back into your physical form, and often that can just terminate the experience. So you kind of want to you kind of want to keep your mind in the dimension that you're operating in, or you want to keep your mind moving in a direction other than physical if you want to prolong the experience. Of course, it goes without saying that levitation and flight are definitely potential and definitely fun avenues of exploration within these planes. And just some tips and tricks. Uh, I know we don't have a whole lot of time, so I'll just cover some 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 poignant ones, and there, there's many of them. Uh, if you want more, uh, of course, there's, there's that William Buhlman book. He goes through a lot of these. Um, and I do actually have an out-of-body CD that has five and a half hours of audio that can, that can help with this as well. Um, so the first one, this is kind of the main one that I find. Uh, haziness, fuzziness, losing clarity, losing your powers, feeling heavy, disorientation, or drifting out of lucidity. So this is either like you've achieved a full-blown out-of-body state and you're kind of losing it, or you just you project out, but you're kind of you're not fully quite there. Like I said, there's gradations of consciousness along that continuum. There's unconscious dreaming, conscious dreaming, and then there's the out of body experience. And there's no crossing line. There's there's the gradation. So if you want to upgrade your your focus, uh, clarity now, awareness now, these work incredibly well. And I, I've definitely used them with success. You just kind of repeat to yourself like a mantra: clarity now or awareness now. What you're doing is just just saying like, hey, let's bring all of my waking consciousness into this experience. Uh, one I also really like to use is looking at my hands. This is a really nice way of, of just reaffirming that you're in a non-physical vehicle. It's an immediate uh, feedback that, okay, I'm, I'm non-physical, I'm in a, in a different reality. And oftentimes I see my hands are actually a little bit see-through, so it's definitely this, this way of, it helps me focus and uh, it's, it's been brought to my attention that this has uh, been passed around by uh, Carlos Castaneda. So it, apparently it has some substance to it, although I kind of just came up with, on it, uh, with it on my own. And so basically what you want to do is refocus yourself immediately. If you're having this experience of like you feel like you know, you're levitating and you start losing your power, you start feeling heavy, you start feeling groggy, you feel like you're, you're losing that lucidity, you just immediately want to bring yourself back to a point of focus. And if you... If you continue to interact within whatever plane you're on, the tendency is that you can just con continue down the continuum and go into a completely unconscious dreaming state. So you want to keep, keep that clarity, keep that intention to be focused and present uh, within your experience. So another uh, aspect of tips and tricks is uh, what if you encounter menacing forms, you know, creatures, beings, demons, whatnot. So, you have to reaffirm to yourself that the external is a reflection of the internal. And so if you can get a handle on that internal vibration, if you're really good at, at focusing your mind and your thought, you can, you can change your external experience. So it's also an incredible opportunity to, to face and to deal with your fears in, in a way that's represented symbolically that, that, is, that can really be powerful in and of itself. So what you want to do is not fall into you know, a, a victim mentality, but to really own your power in these experiences. And I have a saying that if you fight, you're only fighting yourself. I'm sure some famous person said that at some point. I'm not sure who. But the point is that anytime you're, you're in an antagonistic situation, you're literally fighting some portion of yourself, no matter how it's represented and no matter whether it's a physical experience or a non-physical experience. There's that, that when you're fighting, you really are fighting some aspect of yourself. So you firmly want to ask, you want to stand your ground, stand in your power, and just firmly ask, what do you represent? In, in a way that really owns your power. And oftentimes this can really shift the experience and, and change the direction of, of the experience you're having. So you own your power. You really want to affirm in those moments, I create my reality, and this is my creation. And when you own it like that, then you have the capacity to work with that. So all enemies, even physical ones, represent parts of ourselves we haven't yet integrated. Okay, if you find yourself in an environment where you actually have no body and no form, 
this is actually an indication that you've moved into a really deep portion of the universe in which uh, it's a plane of reality where, you, where you, you're there to have direct experience. It's, experience is no longer being translated through symbols that you can manipulate. You're actually having, you're in a realm where, where, where that translation is not taking place. So you've moved really deep into the interior of the universe. And of course, uh, unintended returns to the body. Like I said, if you focus your energy into the body, and w one time I was uh, out of body, and so I realized, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus healing energy to the body. I'm in the energy body. I, I feel like I have all this energy running through me. I'm, I'm just going to focus some healing energy into the physical body and, and create, you know, a, a situation of healing, you know, bringing energy from these other levels and into the physical. And so it was a wonderful experience of feeling energy just channeling into the physical body. And my awareness just followed right along with it. And so, boom, you know, I walk up back in the physical. So it was a nice, nice charge of energy for the body. But also you have to realize that your, your attention determines your locomotion within these non-physical environments. So also what's really important to note is that if you have a long out-of-body experience where, where you're out there and you, you just maintain your consciousness away from the body, for a long time, you're going to have a tendency of being pulled great, further and further towards the realms of source or towards your inner being. You're going to start, uh, as Seth said, you can have double and triple projections within one experience. And so what's happening is as you spend a lot of time within one experience, you'll have a, this tendency of being pulled deeper into the universe. So sometimes you'll have a projection and you're in your astral body. And as you stay there for a long time, you feel yourself beginning to dissolve. And, and then you, you're going to that other level, that deeper level where where you're going beyond the form into a formless dimension. So that's something else um, to keep in mind. I had a, a really long out-of-body once, which was, it went from a kind of a deep dream to, to a lucid dream, and that went on for a while. And then finally I realized, oh my God, I'm out of body. I'm having this conversation with my brother, and I'm trying to tell him, hey, you realize we're out of body, you know? And this is going on and on and on. And eventually I start to realize that my body starts like vibrating, starts going through another like version of a vibrational state, but I'm like, what's happening? And so what, I was starting to get pulled deeper into the universe. Starting, to, My form was actually starting to dissolve. And so being a little bit unprepared for the situation, I, kinda, I got startled. And so oftentimes when you get startled within these, these delicate uh, thought-responsive environments, you can start yourself awake. And so that's actually what happened is, is instead of going deeper, I actually kind of knocked myself out of the experience. And so... Uh, you know, the conscious mind is, is it's ready to handle what it's ready to handle. And so um, sometimes you just get kind of startled by the various experiences and then uh, you, you come back into the body from that. So some ideas for exploration. Uh, just to highlight a few various uh, ways of exploring environments, local distance. You can investigate the energy body, which is also a really nice, nice exercise in which you really uh, get a sense of what's the energy body made of. And, you know, being an energy worker, that's, that's interesting to me. Um, visiting with those who are no longer focused in physical reality, nice one. Um, meeting your aspect, reincarnational, probable, or future selves, that's another good one. You can uh, intend yourself to go into deeper levels of experience of source or your entity level. And uh, my favorite one is experimenting with conscious reality creation, which is, uh, so I'm going to just wrap up with this one. And so here's Seth. Now you see, when you paint a picture, you use your physical body as a tool to create your inner idea. When you create physical matter, you are not aware of doing so, but you affect energy directly in just such an excursion, execution your own attention being primarily focused within the physical system. So he's saying you're focused primarily here, but other levels of the self are, are creating your experience literally like the way an artist creates a painting. This is a very simple analogy, however. In some aspects, a projection to another system could be likened to a situation in which you entered the landscape of one of your paintings. So this is Seth saying that not only are you... Uh, taking yourself with you, you're actually creating the entire environment around you in a projection state, which to me, it's just a, it's a profound statement right there. And then just a few uh, good ones to wrap up with. 
You are learning to transform inner energy by forming it into physical constructions that the plane enables you to manipulate by the formation of particular outer senses for this purpose. And this is Jane's version from Aspect Psychology. This system is mainly concerned with the transformation of energy into physical form, according to intents set by ideas and beliefs. So what they're, actually, what they're both saying here is the physical realm is, is, is actually another version of a projection state. And Seth literally does say that, that the physical experience is another projection of, of, of the entity or source energy into this particular medium. And so what they're saying is that essentially this, this realm, the physical realm, is like a slowed down version of these thought responsive environments. And so conscious reality creation, when you experience it directly through out-of-body states, you can get a, a deeper intuitive understanding of conscious reality creation as it occurs on the physical plane in its slowed down temporal version. And this will be the last. When man realizes that he himself creates his personal and universal environment in concrete terms, then he can begin to create a private and universal environment much superior to the one that is the result of haphazard and unenlightened constructions. So I, I, I believe Linda uh, made reference to this quote earlier. Your real environment is composed of your thoughts and emotions, for from these you form not only this reality, but each reality in which you take part. Your real environment is innocent of space and time as you know them. In your real environment, you have no need for words, for communication is instantaneous. In your real environment, you form the physical world that you know. So basically, in non-physical reality, we are refining our abilities to, to be conscious co-creators. Being in, emerged in, in thought-responsive environments, we get that immediate feedback, which is incredibly uh, uh, wisdom generating to the ego. So what we're also doing is merging the inner and outer ego. We're learning to bring and to bridge the waking consciousness with the inner ego. So you can see that through that, we're going to become conscious of that process that Seth described uh, uh, in the painting quote. Not only are we going to be down here in this waking consciousness down here, we're also going to be aware of the mechanics of conscious reality creation simultaneously. And so literally from that, a whole new consciousness will be born as a result. So obviously operating in these non-physical environments just accelerates our growth and helps merge, helps bring about this merging of the inner and the outer self. Awesome, so thank you. <laughs> and so just two words. Uh, first of all, I, I do have a mailing list and I write articles uh, about once a month. And so if you get on there, you'll hear about all of the various classes and clinical time uh, that I uh, am involved with, as well as you'll get articles about inner alchemy practices, out-of-body experiences, and so forth. And the other thing is I do have a CD, and, and uh, I know we ran out of time here, but I have five and a half hours of audio where I go into all this in, in much greater detail, and that, that's in the back as well. And so it's a, just one MP3 CD. It's, it's MP3 format, so it's five and a half hours just on one, on one disc. So um, thanks for your time. <laughs>